Okay, um, you guys ready? It's not going to be that exciting. Sorry. Um, no, actually, um, what I foresee as we go through some of this stuff, a lot of this stuff is basic, basic things that you probably have heard somewhere else before. Um, but where I think we're really going to um, have some interesting discussions towards the end where maybe we can talk about specific examples of things and, and I can answer specific <coughs> questions for everybody. Um, before, before we get started, I'll, I'll uh, just click through a little bit about me so you get an idea who I am. My name is Phil Duper. I'm a sergeant with the San Bernardino <laughs> County Sheriff's Department. I'm currently assigned to the Rancho Cucamonga Contract City Station. Um, for those of you who kind of understand how that works, a lot of cities especially starting in the late 60s, um, decided that it was too expensive to maintain their own police department, and so they contract out. It's called contract law enforcement. And most of the time it's done with sheriff's departments, however, it can be done with other agencies as well. Um, but we have uh, 13 contract cities in, in, uh, within the sheriff's department where we act as the police department in that particular city. So currently I work in Ranch Cucamonga. We call it the Ranch Cucamonga Police Department. Um, it, it's a little confusing because sometimes we talk about being with the sheriff's department. The sheriff signs my paycheck, but I really do work in the city ranch of Cucamonga, so. Mm -hmm. I'll have my information up at the end if, uh, if anybody would like to get a hold of me for any specific reason. A little bit about me. Um, I've been in and around law enforcement uh, since I was a teenager. I started in the Explorer Scout program, which is a high school program for teenagers uh, back in 1988. Uh, currently the traffic sergeant at the Ranch Cucamonga Station, where I oversee the traffic division. We have 20 employees, and those are our guys on motorcycles, our DUI investigators, and our accident investigators. I worked a number of variety of assignments uh, from the jails uh, to patrol at several places. I was a detective for quite a while. Uh, worked major narcotics for a little bit. I've got real interesting stories, and, and I'm working there. That was a lot of fun. And I've been a sergeant now for about five years. Um, you got a couple of pictures up there. I've been on the TV show Cops a few times in my career. They've ridden with me as a, both a deputy and as a detective when I was a detective. If you see any of the Ranch Cucamonga or Fontana episode, you might see me on there. That was, a, that was a pretty fun experience. This is what I tell people I do. It's real cool. Ride a motorcycle, drive fast cars. That's my, that's my boy right there. Um, Unfortunately, this is what people think I really do. <laughs> and that's work in traffic enforcement. So. Tonight, or this afternoon, we're, or this morning rather, sorry, we're going to uh, talk about some common crimes and victims of those crimes, some prevention strategies, which is why you guys are here. Um, and I'll have some real case examples of some things to talk about at the end and then uh, the discussion that I was talking about earlier. I have to start the disclaimer here. How about that Bill Gates? Uh, here's a guy, if you got a computer, you know who Bill Gates is, and uh, he's, uh, he's like a, a billionaire a billion times over, and he, uh, he invented the Microsoft uh, thing, and as a result, <laughs> he's, uh, he's uh, terribly wealthy, and in two years, he's gonna retire. He's gonna step down from his daily routines at Microsoft, and now, uh, in honor of all he's done for the computer industry, uh, Microsoft is releasing this celebratory announcement. In 1975, Bill Gates dropped out of Harvard to start his own software company. Little did he know that Microsoft would become one of the world's most powerful corporations, generating annual revenue of 40 billion... Oh, crap. <laughs> I can fix this. So long, Bill. From all your pals at Microsoft. <laughs> all right, isn't that the way it always works? Uh, we got a plan, and I'm going to try to get through that plan, and hopefully the PowerPoint works, but um, if it doesn't, I blame Microsoft. Um, but in addition to that, we might talk about some things that might be a little uncomfortable. I'm going to try to stay away from that stuff. I want to talk in generalities. Um, but just out of curiosity, and you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to, has anybody in the room been a victim of a crime? Any crime? Oh, maybe. Yeah. Probably, probably most of us, right? Okay. I know I have several times, um, even as a law enforcement officer, uh, been victim of a few things. So I often tell people um, with certain types of crimes, it's not a matter of if it's going to happen to you. It's, it's almost a matter of when and if you're going to be prepared to handle it. 
Uh, one other thing I, I kind of breezed through at the beginning, um, I'm also on a local city council. Um, and being a city council member gives me a, a unique perspective. I get to look at things from a lot of different angles. And, and um, I, I try to draw on my experience in law enforcement. Um, and it, it's interesting, the council thing has also given me a new perspective on law enforcement, too. So um, anyway, a little bit about me. All right, moving on. <coughs> Common crimes directed towards women. The most common are the ones up at the top, and the not so common, but they do happen more than you think, are down at the bottom. Probably the most, uh, the most common are vehicle burglaries. Has anybody had their car broken into? That's a safe one, right? Probably a lot of people. Um, identity theft, right? Um, home burglaries, now we're getting a little, a little more dangerous. And robberies, you don't have to raise your hands at all. Um, it's important to kind of tell you, a lot of people don't quite understand the difference between terminology and, and when we talk about crimes. A robbery is when somebody takes something from you as a person, either by force or fear. If they run up and they grab your purse and they push you down and take your, your purse, that's a robbery. If they come into your store with a gun, that's a robbery. If you're not home or you're not around your vehicle and they break into it, that's a burglary. And they have very different penalties attached to them. So we often hear somebody robbed my house. Well, not really what they did is they broke in and they burglarized your house. It, it, I know it's a technical thing, but it, it really does matter when we start talking about penalties and what happens. Um, some of the more common things that, um, that are talk, tough to talk about, we, um, domestic violence, kidnapping, false imprisonment, and obviously rape. I'm not gonna talk too much about those because they are um, fairly, uh, they're not as common as the other ones, and sometimes they can elicit different emotions and stuff from people. Towards the end, if, again, if we want to we get into a discussion and talk about specific things, we'll, we'll go into some of that stuff. Vehicle burglaries. A vehicle burglary is an opportunity crime. It occurs when valuable items are left in plain sight, more often than not. Criminals seek the maximum reward for the least amount of risk. And we'll talk about that in a couple of slides. It, for a criminal, for the most part, they're, they're trying to get in and out real quick. They want to get what they can get and they want to be gone. A vehicle burglary is um, probably the least punished crime in, in the burglary section, and uh, they happen a lot. And um, there's some factors to determine whether or not it's a felony or misdemeanor, and then some state law just changed uh, two months ago that I, that I do want to talk about, and that's important for everybody to realize. Commonly stolen items out of vehicles. You guys familiar with some of these things? Wallets, bags, purses, computers, iPods, iPhones, uh, GPS, navigation equipment, credit cards and debit cards, which then leads into things like identity theft. Identity theft occurs when somebody steals your name and or other personal identifying information for fraudulent purposes. They can strike anyone, anywhere, and at any time and possibly go on for years if you don't realize it. One of the new emerging trends right now in identity theft is to um, find out young children, babies' social security numbers. Mm -hmm. Criminals can then open up credit accounts and they can be doing damage for years before anybody would ever realize it. The crime does not adhere to geographic or socioeconomic boundaries um, and it devastates the victims. Um, there's often a looming specter of continued financial devastation and or incarceration. Some of the common identity theft crimes, forgery, credit fraud, false personation. Forgery, this is the boring stuff, sorry, we're gonna get through it. The fraudulent signing of another person's name to an instrument such as a deed, mortgage, or check. Making of a fake document or altering of a real one with the intent to commit fraud. Credit fraud, applying for credit or financial assistance with false information manufacturing or counterfeiting credit cards, bank cards, or EBT cards. In, in my history as a detective, I, for about three and a half years, I worked identity theft as a primary uh, function of my job. And I traveled all over Southern California um, chasing criminals. And I saw people that were making credit cards. I saw people that were had infiltrated banks and other high-level institutions and, and all kinds of things. So one of those will tell you a story on. Using a stolen credit card, access number, or password to obtain goods or services, and uh, promissory schemes with the attempt to defraud the victim. False personation. 
And this ties into another one of my case examples in a little bit. Assuming another person's identity to avoid civil liability or criminal prosecution. What we're finding criminals are doing now is when they steal somebody's identity, they are impersonating them when they go commit crimes. And we've had people that show up later with something on their, on their history or maybe a warrant out for the rest. Um, I had a case personally where a teacher had to renew her teaching credentials and um, a warrant popped up for her on a case and she had no idea what it was all about. It turns out somebody was using her name and had been arrested using her name and it was a pain for her to clear that up. Not only through the court system, but through Department of Justice and getting it off her record, it's just incredibly hard. Why identity theft? It's pretty easy. Um, you can see it's so easy a caveman can do it. Um, it's pretty easy to steal information. Suspects find it easier than other crimes to avoid detection and apprehension, and it's often less enforced and punished. Um, here's, here's a reality. Crime is, is crime, and, and wherever you commit it, it's, it's the same penalty. It's the, it should have the same penalty attached. But often, the problem is, is, is depending on where it occurs, that specific area or agency may not have the resources to pursue it. So there is a uh, large prominent city in the East Valley of San Rio County, it may or may not be the county seat, um, <laughs> has a big problem with violent crime. Um, in that city, their officers, their detectives are tasked with chasing down all the shootings and stabbings and things that happen every day. They aren't working things like this. They don't have the time to work things like this. As a detective, you, you get a caseload, but you have to prioritize what you can actually accomplish and handle and what's more important. So you look at the severity of the crime, you deal with those cases first, then you look at, do I have any leads? Is there anything I can actually do with this? A lot of times when you call the police and a, and a patrol officer comes out to your house and takes a report, you think, all right, this, this is good. They took a report, they're gonna get these guys. Um, probably out of every 100 reports, maybe 10 of those get assigned to a detective. And then that detective again has to prioritize because he's getting cases every day put on his desk and he can't solve all of them. So it is important that we try to minimize being victims by protecting ourselves and um, doing some of the things that, that, that'll follow here. How do they do identity theft? Vehicle burglaries, big one. Residential burglaries, employee theft at various organizations, mail theft, Dumpster diving, see the guy in there, he's got some paperwork in the dumpster. Mm -hmm. Online theft, we call it phishing, um, and victim inattention. This is actually a letter that we, uh, we seized in a search warrant. <coughs> it's from a suspect he was writing to a girlfriend. Basically he says, is that crazy? I couldn't believe it, I got long love from that judge. So since I can do 47 days standing on my head, I'm already out here doing what I was doing when I got busted. Already got a new laptop computer, a new color printer, a new scanner, everything new, top of the line, and ready to roll. F the police. I've done more time for not paying traffic tickets on time than I'm gonna to have to do on this case. <laughs> okay, can't do that. So uh, this is actually a detective I worked with for many years, and uh, just to give you an idea, we, we actually would see this. We'd see counterfeit driver's licenses, um, they're getting harder and harder to make with the new features, security features that are put on them, but um, I've gone into houses where people have a whole wall painted blue so they can take their picture in front of it and just keep manufacturing IDs. Um, a little, some of these pictures are a little dated, it's a little more high-tech now, but um, these are devices to make credit cards. They're out there, they're available on the internet, devices to skim cards. When you go to the ATM, how often do you really examine that ATM to make sure when you put your card in it, you're actually putting it into the ATM machine? There are guys that will attach things to the outside of the machine that look real, look like they're part of it, it'll pass your card through, but as it does, it skims your information off of it. This doesn't have any audio with it, so it's not broken. So you're having a light, nice lunch and you hand him your debit card and he's a great waiter. I think they were talking about how exceptional the service was. And as he walks away, bam, there you go. Just that easy. Um, how many of you received uh, false emails from your bank, things like that? We call them phishing scams. 
This happens to older people a lot more than, um, than you realize, and a lot of times they fall victim to it because they believe it's legitimate. Here's a, here's a scam, reports to be Wells Fargo, says, hey, you need to sign on right away. I get these all the time in my email, I, I don't know if it's the rest of you. You go to a website, it looks official, you put in your username and password, and, and that's all she wrote. Okay, on to burglary. Each year in the United States, there are more than five million home burglaries. Nine out of 10 of these crimes are preventable. The risk of being burglarized can greatly be reduced by taking simple steps to make sure your home is more difficult to enter and less enticing to the would-be burglars. Now let's break down burglary a little bit. We have vehicle burglary, commercial burglary, and residential burglary. At the low end of the scale is breaking into somebody's car, and that's why it happens more. The next level would be commercial burglary. I worked a, a case with um, LA County Sheriff for a few years and it's resurfaced recently. You might have seen things in the papers about it. It was a specific uh, nationality, an Eastern European nationality, that were doing bank burglaries. Okay? Um, we, they had been arrested a few years prior out of Riverside County. Um, we had a few cases that we got up on. We had a task force going. We ended up arresting them went back to prison, they got back out, and then recently they were just arrested again, it was on the news. What this group would do is they would go to um, a lot of the foreign national banks that are in strip malls, not necessarily the, the big banks that have their own buildings, but they go to these strip malls. They get up on the roof, um, they'd have a guy who was a cutting guy, they'd have a, a metal guy, they'd have you know, a safe cracker, they're all part of this team, and they'd cut a hole in the roof, drop down in, um, disable the surveillance security systems, get into the vault and steal fifty, hundred thousand dollars at a time. I think that's a lot of money, right? Um, it's a commercial burglary. It's not considered a violent crime. Um, I don't even believe you'd go to state prison for that in today's world, okay? Part of that has to do with realignment that we went through um, in 2013 where the state said nonviolent prisoners are no longer gonna be housed in the state prison system. We're gonna push them down onto county jails. Does anybody realize what happened with that? Mm -hmm. County jails were full. They were already full. So that meant that a lot of people came down to county jails and went right out the door. As it stands right now in our county, and, and it's, it's pretty scary to think about, uh, we are out of bed space. When somebody comes in the front door, somebody goes out the back door. So the realities are, unless you are, are really committing violent, violent crimes, you're not going to stay in jail. Uh, the next level is residential burglary. Now, residential burglary is considered a violent crime because it is entering a person's house. And even if you're not home, the state still considers that a violent crime. So people can still go to uh, state prison for this. Um, anyway, entering a building or vehicle or structure with the intent to commit theft or any other felony crime is a burglary. What we would do a lot of times, especially if we had these uh, booster crews and big rings that would go in and steal things from uh, uh, malls and you know, uh, big, big chain stores and supermarkets and things, is we would charge them with burglary because they're going into a structure or a building with the intent to commit a theft. Something changed two months ago, Prop 47. How many of you voted two months ago? Remember that? How many of you saw those ads with the, the dead police officer's wife who said, oh my God, you got to vote yes for Prop 47. It's going to help out everybody. And saw the two liberal DAs from Northern California <laughs> that said, oh, this is what's going to save our state. We need to do this. And so we voted in Prop 47. Prop 47 took commercial burglary, vehicle burglary, and entering all these businesses and thefts and all that stuff and made them all misdemeanors. <laughs> It also, the way they sold it was it's, we're, we're taking drug possession and making it misdemeanors also, which it did. And there was a big cry that, hey, you know, drug possession is really just a victimless, a victimless crime. And these poor guys are going to prison, you know, for having possession of cocaine and drugs and those really harmless things. So why are we doing that? And that's really how it was sold to the public. But it was written into the law that a lot of these other nonviolent crimes would be turned into misdemeanors as well. So, the way it works in our county, if you're arrested for a misdemeanor, um, whatever, some type of theft, uh, maybe a battery, assault and battery, you get in a fight, or something like that, you go to one of our county jails, you're there long enough for us to write a ticket, a promise to appear that you're going to come back on court, and we ship you right out the door. So, 
there are a lot more um, offenders out there running around, and that's why we really need to watch what we do and how we interact. Who are the victims of crime? It could be anyone, anywhere, and any time. Or really are they? We actually are, are, are pretty lucky that this really encompasses most of our criminals out there. break into the building and they thought they'd break the glass. It was obviously shatterproof glass. Um, we're actually pretty lucky that most of our criminals really are not that sophisticated. Um, unfortunately, there are a few that they are. The reality is, is we're not catching the sophisticated ones. And if we do, it's few and far between. Here's the crime prevention triangle. And this is what you can control to some degree. Um, whether or not you're going to be the victim or the target, we can't always control that. We can't control the criminal or his desire, but the one thing we can control is opportunity. You don't need to dedicate your life to being a crime fighter or even alter your life that much. You just need to realize that this can happen to you. The biggest part of keeping out of trouble is in what you don't do. Don't be a target. Pay attention to what's going on around you. Um, I told my wife I was going to throw her down here today. Um, <laughs> Some of this is, is my wife, and it's a lot, of, a lot of women. Don't throw anything on me, please. My wife is very trusting, very believing. She loves everybody, and uh, she's not always paying attention or not always aware. And um, I get a little frustrated, obviously, because I, in my career I see things. Um, my wife likes to park and leave her purse in the car, and likes to leave her keys in the purse. And, Often will leave the house with both sets of keys, and then I can't leave the house. That might be on purpose. I don't know. Um, but uh, so pay attention to what's going on around you. Tell someone where you're going, when you'll be back. Walk with confidence. Walk like you own the place. Ninety percent of criminals, they're watching you, and they don't want to have a confrontation with you. And if you walk and you look around and you look people in the eye. That says that you're not afraid and you're aware of what's going on. They would rather go on to somebody else and not waste their time with you. You really, 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 really need to work on this if, that's a, if this is a problem. Looking around, walking with your head up, and, and checking out your surroundings. Try not to go out alone. If you have to, stay within sight of people or within yelling distance of people. And, and actually use busy streets because you want people around you. Someone should know your itinerary. Trust your instincts. Now, where I was slowing down my wife, I will tell you that women have way better instincts than men do. Um, you guys know when something's not right. Trust that. If the situation makes you feel uncomfortable, leave. Don't get distracted with electronics, Facebook, phone calls. As a traffic cop, unfortunately, we see this a lot. We pull up to a car. <laughs> Happens, right? Um, avoid situations instead of figuring out how to get out of one. And some examples are parties and large groups of people where, you know, maybe if you, know, if, if you thought you shouldn't be there, you probably shouldn't be there. If approached, follow your gut feeling. Look directly at the person. Don't be taken by surprise. Be stern and say, no thanks. Change your walking direction. We have people that come to our door and solicit. Um, I'm kind of, I don't want to say rude, but uh, I, I won't listen to the whole spiel. I don't, you know, I already know I'm not interested. I'll say, no thanks, we're not interested. And my wife gets mad, oh, that, wasn't, that was rude. You should have listened to him. You know, um, trust your judgment, but um, if you're not interested, tell them no. Tell them to go away or walk away from them. Change your direction. Um, go into a public place, and if needed, call the police. Now. Getting serious, if the suspect has, has a gun, or a knife, or a weapon, give him what he wants, give him your purse, it's not worth your life. Um, but try to remember what he looks like, what he sounds like, if he has tattoos, which way he left, if he has a cast on, if he's wearing 
green pants and a purple shirt after Labor Day. And I know that's right, you can't do that. <laughs> uh, if there's a car involved, try to remember a license plate or at least part of it. With our technology now, we can actually search on, on partial license plates. Um, there are so many different things out there that's capturing data and information. There are cameras now in a lot of cities that are reading license plates as you drive through intersections. There are cameras on police cars. There's cameras on private vehicles that, um, for like repossession agents and things like that, that are now tying in and we're able to search on those records. So if we get a partial license plate, um, not only can we search the DMV, but we can go back and look through all those camera systems and, and maybe we can catch somebody. A color, make, a model. Does it have any dents or damage? Any outstanding bumper stickers? Um, anything distinguishing on it? Like that one, right? <laughs> Is there, uh, anybody remember what color that car was? Multi. Multi color. How many doors did it have? Four. Four doors. Four doors. Yeah. Good. <laughs> when out in public, when, when you're traveling a route, vary it. But make sure you know where you're going. It's not good to get lost on a cul-de-sac. Walk with confidence. <laughs> I've never done that. Um, bathrooms. When you walk into a bathroom, put your purse over your shoulder. Um, secure your purse. It's a good idea to walk with your purse on your shoulder, uh, your strap over your shoulder anyway. Um, don't make it easy for somebody to run up and grab that thing out of your hand. Avoid carrying lots of bags and packages and things in your hand. And don't overburden yourself in case you need to fight back. Elevators. Take elevators rather than stairs. Why? A lot of people don't take stairs. Most people ride, we're all lazy, we all ride the elevator. So the chances are if you got into a problem, somebody might get on that elevator as opposed to getting on the stairs or coming down the stairs. Try not to ride with a stranger. If you're uncomfortable, get off the elevator. Like this guy says, just so you know, if this elevator breaks down, I have no problem cannibalizing your body for my survival. <laughs> Parking lots and garages, this is a big one. Um, I'm sure none of you like to shop, um, but if you did, try to avoid parking next to big vehicles where your view can be blocked, um, next to the sliding doors of vans. Don't forget where you park, it's pretty obvious. I know I do this a lot, I wander around the parking lot trying to remember where I parked. It makes you look like a victim. Park near lighting, um, that's something I always try to do. I try to park my car underneath the light have your keys and alarm ready as you're walking up, not fumbling for them. Check your vehicle before getting in. Maybe look underneath it or look around it. If possible, walk with other people, even if you don't know them. You see a group of people walking out, try to tag along with them as you're going. First thing when you get in, lock your doors, put your seatbelt on, and drive away. Don't sit in your car. Now, this is actually um, something that we apply in, in our um, work life as a training officer and the way I work on patrol when I'm on patrol, um, at the end of every call that we handle, we have to get back in our car and we have to enter comments in the computer to basically say what happened at the call, what we did. And uh, some guys do it, some guys don't. But I always used to try to teach my guys, start the car up, let's drive around the corner, we'll go somewhere where we're safe, we don't have to worry about people running out of that house, or whatever the call was on. And I mean, you know, it, it depends. But, I don't have to worry about sitting there buried in my computer and somebody coming up and doing something bad to me. Same thing applies to you. Get in your car and drive away. Sitting in the car is, is just asking for somebody to come up and ask you for change or something like that. Observe what's going on around you, who is watching you, other people sitting in cars. Um, I have a, an assigned unmarked police car. It's got lights and siren on it. Um, and it's got a computer in it, all guns, all kinds of stuff. But on the outside, it looks like a normal car. People don't know who I am. Um, if, and I do this occasionally. I'll be on the freeway or I'll be going somewhere and somebody will go blowing past me or cut me off and I will pull them over. I'll turn on my lights and siren and pull them over. But the reality is they don't really know that I'm a cop or not. And if that happens to you and you don't feel comfortable with it, drive somewhere like to a gas station, pull off the freeway, um, don't do 120 miles an hour and weave in and out of traffic because I might think you're running. <laughs> but just drive normal, drive the speed limit. And it actually happened to me the other day, I uh, went to pull a guy over on the freeway for, for doing something really, really not very smart. And, um, and you know, he didn't think I was a real cop. 
I had the siren, everything going, I had flashing lights that are in my dashboard, all that stuff. Um, but after a while, he did pull over and then he realized, and um, I didn't write him a ticket, just gave him a warning. But um, if, if that happens to you, go somewhere well lit, well occupied. Um, the other part of that story is that a lot of times I'll, I'll be driving around and uh, just the other night I was heading home and I had to stop to do something on my computer or return a phone call or something. And I, I pulled in and parked on the side of the, of the road so I wouldn't crash. And I, I pulled in behind a lady and she was getting out of her car. She didn't think twice, didn't look at me, didn't, I mean, and again, you don't know who I am. And I'm, I'm in an unmarked car, it could have been anybody, sitting in front of her house. And I thought, man, wow, she just didn't even see me, didn't even phase her. That would bother me. If I see any vehicle parked in front of my house, I want to know who's in it, what they're doing. Usually it's my in laws. <laughs> the other thing is don't put your valuables in plain sight. It's not only to preserve your stuff. I mean, it seems like a no brainer, but people do it. Um, but also to protect your identity and who you are. A lot of times people put mail and things on their front seat with your address and things like that on them. You've got to be careful with that stuff. If you are approached, and here's a disclaimer, we don't profile a person, we profile behavior. And this is true in law enforcement also. More often than not, um, we're not, if you drive by, by me in a decent car that's got it's registered, doesn't have to be a nice car, and you're dressed <coughs> appropriately, and you're not doing anything that draws my attention, I don't even see you. Um, and most guys don't, they, we don't see that. But there are things that criminals do that draws our attention. And it's so hard to quantify and explain it, but it just does. And after you've done it for a while, you get it, you see it, you know. Um, it's the way they look at you or don't look at you. It's, it's the way they try to move away from you. Um, there are a lot of things that really stick out to us. And, and you can apply those same things too. You'll know if something's not right. If somebody's following you, you know, somebody approaches you and, and they obviously are dangerous. Statistically, if you're taken somewhere, um, the chances of your survival really do diminish. So if, if somebody puts hands on you, you need to fight back. Now this class or this, this presentation this morning is not about how to fight back. I, I'm not gonna teach you, you know, moves and kicks and all that kind of stuff. There are plenty of, of different things you can do and sign up and take those classes and, um, and learn that stuff. But you gotta fight back in some way. At least make noise, honk your horn, run, do that type of thing. While you're driving, <laughs> keep, keep your vehicle in gear. Leave room between your car and the car ahead of you. Another trick I used to teach my trainees, um, and I try to follow it, sometimes I don't. Um, when, when we come up to a car parked in front of us at a, at a light or a stop, try to leave enough distance where you can see the bottom of their tires. If you can see the bottom of their tires, that means you can safely drive around them without hitting their vehicle. Mm -hmm. So if, if I'm at a stop and I need to go to an emergency call or I need to take off or do something, I need to stop far enough back away where I can get, get around them. Same thing applies to you guys. As you're driving, you don't need to stop right up on a person's bumper. Vehicle code says you gotta stop. It doesn't say you gotta stop two inches from them. Give yourself a space cushion. Give yourself an exit, a way out of that. Um, place valuables on the floor, not on the seat. Be observant while stopped at intersections and program police numbers into your cell phone. If you think you're being followed, don't drive home. Go to a police station. Um, I put fire station on there, although we all know they're probably gonna be sleeping. <laughs> but if you honk the horn, they'll think it's a fire, they'll jump down the pole, so it'll be cool. Um, 24 hour Rite Aid, someplace like that. And, and know where you're going to try to go to. If your car breaks down, stay in your car. If the light, leave the lights on if you can. Um, don't accept rides. Someone offers to help, ask them to call the police for you. Don't leave your car to go get help. And if you can, drive your car to a well-lit area. Consider sitting in the passenger seat to make it look like there's more people. I would not ever, ever, ever recommend standing outside your car with your hood up or sitting in your car with your hood up. That advertises my car doesn't work, I can't get away from it. It is a policy of the California Highway Patrol because they got sued a few years ago. Um, if they see a vehicle stopped on the side of the road, they're supposed to stop and check that vehicle out. Doesn't matter if the hood's up or not. It, and, and because what happened is something similar. They actually stopped, and I'm not putting them down. It, it, 
was legitimate. Um, they stopped, talked to a person who said, oh, my husband's on, on his way, he's coming to get me. And you're, you're okay? I'm good, I'm fine, okay. And the officer drove away, somebody pulled up and did something bad to the young lady. Uh -huh. So they, they got sued and they changed their policy. And their policy is now they gotta make sure that you're gonna be safe before you get off the highway. Um, there's those road service uh, tows that'll stop now too. You know, if it's a it's a random tow truck, I don't know. If it says, you know, road service on it, I'd probably trust that a little bit better. But don't advertise the position you're in. Watch out for con artists. Don't fall for anything that sounds too good to be true. Seek the advice of a family member. If you, if you like, I won the Nigerian lottery. <laughs> all I have to do is send them $200,000 and I get a million. Um, don't give out your social security card numbers, credit card information, anything like that on the phone if you can help it. Don't let anyone uh, pressure you into signing anything, sales agreements, contracts, insurance policies. Now, I'm going to give you a good, really good piece of advice for identity theft and credit card fraud. How many people use their credit card when they're out shopping? Every, right? How many people use their debit card when they're out shopping? Every, right? Challenge you. Instead of using your debit card, use your credit card. And this is why. If somebody accesses your debit card or gets your debit card information, they can drain your bank account. Does everybody know how hard it is to get the bank to give you back your money? It's pretty hard. It can take months sometimes. Um, I try to use my credit card as much as I can when I'm in those situations that are kind of sketchy. The reason being is the credit card is not my money. It's the bank's money. So if they get my credit card and they run up a trillion dollars and I prove it's not me and it was fraud, the bank's gonna eat that. I don't have to wait two months to get my money back. Now, I do realize there's interest rates involved in using your credit card. So this is where you gotta be you know, prudent and make sure you're making payments and, and doing all that stuff. However, if I purchase anything online, it's with my credit card. If I go to a restaurant that I'm not com comfortable, very, very, very few restaurants I'll use my debit card. And it's very, very few. Most of the time I'll use my credit card because you're handing that to somebody and you don't really, really know what's going on in the background. So again, I'd rather play with the bank's money than my money. Burglary prevention. Outside lights should be mounted out of reach so the burglars can't easily unscrew light bulbs. Um, consider having motion sensor lights. The, the bottom line is you cannot have enough lighting around your house. Lighting deters criminals. Why? It's not anything magic. They can go to your next door neighbor's house who doesn't have the lights. And that's the reality. Um, unfortunately, that's really what we're talking about. What we're talking about is diverting their attention off of you and onto somebody else who's not there. Um, use light timers to activate lights when you're gone, um, or ask a neighbor to help you out with that when you're gone. And install deadbolt locks, locks on your doors and windows. Um, again, if they have to struggle or mess with it, chances are they're going to give up and go next door. Inventory your belongings. Keep receipts, especially for expensive items. It's, uh, if anybody's had their house burglarized, how easy was it for you to get all of your money back from the insurance company? You don't. It doesn't happen. And they will question you about everything. They'll give you a hard time. They won't believe you. Um, consider photographing your valuables, engraving names, IDs, and codes on them. A lot of people now are videotaping. Um, you know, once a year they go through and they videotape their house. Keep the videotape somewhere else where the burglar's not going to go. Take the videotapes. Get a dog, even a small dog. The reality is. 90%, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but 90% of burglars don't like dogs. And they don't want to deal with the dog. And that's probably one of the cheapest security systems you can purchase. Or get a regular alarm system, surveillance system, or leave a radio or television on. Um, I was just a, we were just a victim of a, of a theft a um, couple of times this year, actually. Um, I, I believe we live in a, in a very safe neighborhood. Um, we have a very nice house. Um, we had some patio furniture out on our front, uh, front of the house, and my wife had a topiary next to the front door. The first thing we noticed missing was the topiary. And somebody came up, it would have taken probably two guys to pick up this potted plant and carry it off our porch. Um, a couple months later, somebody actually cut the locks off of our gates, got into our yard, and took some patio heaters that were in the back backyard. Um, and a, 
I said, okay, I'm getting, a, I'm going to put up a video system. We've always had an alarm, always had an alarm. We haven't been broken into, knock on wood, inside the house, but we had stuff taken from outside. So uh, I said, I'm going to get a video system. I'm going to do it. It was on my plan. And uh, they came and took our patio furniture off our front porch. So that was strike three. So now I have a Wazoo surveillance system. I have 16 high definition cameras around the outside of my house. <laughs> um, um, I actually have 17, I have another one on the front porch. Uh, I can tell everything that happens there now. Uh, not, that it's, not that it's going to stop it ultimately, but I'll get a good idea who did it. And believe me, I'll be hunting them down. Um, the second thing is that my cameras are not, I don't have them hidden. I mean, they're installed professionally. They look very well. I mean, they look mounted very well. They look nice. If they walk up onto my porch, you see the camera that's looking right at you. And again, tells them, I'll move next door. If you are the victim of a burglary, if you come home and find an open door or window, and this happens a lot, don't go inside. The burglar could still be in there. Call 911. We will come out. Uh, we do this probably, we experience it maybe three or four times a day in Ranch Cucamonga. Um, people, I mean, this, this, these type of crimes happen. Uh, we'll go in, we'll check the house, we'll make sure nobody's there. Um, it also kind of stops you from wanting to get in there and move things around because you need to protect the crime scene, leave everything as it is. It's real hard when everything's, you know, rummaged through, I understand. But sometimes we can, uh, we can mess up evidence and things like that. Ask witnesses to stay until we get there so um, we can get all their information and a direct statement from them. Probably one of the most important things is if you ever have to call 911 and you have to talk to one of our dispatchers, they're trained to ask you certain questions. Now, sometimes the logic and why they ask those questions, I don't know. Sometimes we don't understand it out in the field. Um, but they are trained a certain way and they, and they do ask specific questions for specific reasons. But the things we want to know as we're responding to that location, we want to know what the person looks like, what the vehicle looks like, what direction did they go. And so it's going to be hard, but try to keep your composure and answer the questions. Don't hang up until you're told to do so. And then ultimately, if you see something, try not to get involved in it. Be a better witness than a victim. All right, All right let's talk about some case. SMTs. Oh, uh, scars, marks, and tattoos. Sorry, industry term. So uh, there's a little case study here, um, and I've got a couple other ones that would be better after this one. But This um, started out with Levitt's Furniture, out of business now, but Levitt's contacted us and said, hey, um, we just got an order for some furniture to be delivered to this house in Ranch Cucamonga, and um, we're doing a little background and credit check on this lady that just ordered you know, $25,000 worth of furniture, and it's a little old lady in Minnesota. And we're thinking this probably isn't real. Um, so it was really good. Levitz was one of those companies that really liked to work with law enforcement. There are a few companies out there that do work very well with us, um, that will give us information. There are some companies out there that don't want to work with law enforcement at all. And when you're the victim of a crime, they don't want to give us any help with it. And um, it's, it's frustrating. Um, but everybody's afraid of getting sued. Everybody's afraid of, you know, perceptions, things like that. So um, that, those are the struggles. But Levitt's called us up. We set up a sting. We pretended to be Levitt's delivery drivers. We had a couple of detectives that dressed down. Um, and we ended up hitting this house. That was our truck. And it's one of our detectives. He's standing there with the ball cap. A couple of my partners. And what we found out was... Um, these young ladies um, had a couple of boyfriends. Uh, well, this is going to apply to probably maybe some of the older, let me say, wiser people in the room. Before the age of the internet, how did you order stuff without going to the store? Telephone. Ma telephone. No. Mail order. Oh, mail order. Mail order. How many people would order things out of magazines? You fill out your information and send it back. This was a, this was a, a clearinghouse warehouse where after all those applications would come through, they would store thousands and thousands of boxes and boxes of these credit applications. Wow. So um, the, the boyfriends in this case um, actually were on parole. So you'd wonder how they got a job they're working there, but hey. And then there were boxes and boxes of these applications that they would just take home a box every day. I mean, you know, whatever. And so they would go through 
apply for credit cards, ID cards, you know, things like that. Um, and these are some, some pictures from that. Um, this, uh, this is a significant case for me, um, and because uh, when it was all said and done, we went to trial on this, and uh, Mr. Otuba um, was sentenced to a, a significant amount of time in state prison. I'm sure he's probably out now. At the time, he got a sentence of 21 and a half years in state prison because the, the extents of all the crimes and the entire package we put together was, was pretty long and involved. Um, it is the longest sentence for identity theft in California, and I think there's only one longer in the United States, and that was in Texas, and that was like 22 or 23 years. But there were literally um, thousands of victims on this case. It started out with a, uh, a little old lady um, by the name of Ms. Uh, Vasiliki Disopoulos, a little Greek lady. And uh, she was the type of victim that would not let it go. And she did her own homework. She, you know, I mean, just would call me every day, like, I'm going to get a little uh, goofy on this because she was a really nice lady. She actually brought me baklava one time. So um, she just was frustrated because somebody stole her identity. Didn't know any of these people or any of this stuff. But uh, we started working in this case and we had, a, we had a break in it. Basically what we found out is Mr. Otuba um, fancied himself as a musician, as a um, hip hop star, at least that's what he would claim to be. Um, drove a nice car, flashed a lot of gold, jewelry, things like that. And what he would do uh, is he would walk, go into banks and he would find tellers and he would target specific tellers at these banks. And he would look for people that he thought maybe had low self-esteem. And he would go and he would spend time at those windows and he'd talk about how much he thought they were so beautiful and he would establish relationships. And pretty soon he had about six or seven girls that worked at different banking institutions in his little harem. Um, ultimately, a couple of them working their way up, and this was going on for several years, working their way up through the corporate ladder. One of them ended up working at the Bank of America security building in downtown Los Angeles. There's two major security buildings for Bank of America, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. This is a very nondescript, you wouldn't even know what it is, no signs or anything like that. She worked inside the security building and had access to millions of records. So they would then um, do all kinds of identity theft and fraud, and these were a couple of the girls that were out. Um, these are photos of them cashing checks, going to different banks, making withdrawals, things like that. Um, they lived in a pretty nice house, did search warrants at those houses. You know, we, we always find lots of cell, we call them uh, drop phones cell phones, you find things in the trash. Um, this was an interesting turn of events on this particular case where we, we did a search warrant at this house with, for one of the girls. She lived with her parents. We took her to jail. We started listening to her jail phone calls. As she was talking to her dad on the phone, um, she says, you know, hey, what happened? The dad says, they were here, they searched your room, but don't worry, they didn't get all the stuff because I hid all that other stuff that you had. <laughs> and well, what would you do with it? Well, I threw it away in the backyard in the trash. Um, I think both parents were like pastors or heavily involved in their church. Um, so we hit this house and of course found lots of stuff, different victims. So you counterfeit driver's licenses out of different states. And of course, usually where all this stuff exists, there's always some type of crime or violence that occurs with it. And you have lots of guns and stuff with them too. Um, we talk about personal safety. This was a case that we handled in 2007, uh, out of, also out of Ranch Cucamonga. How many people here have shopped at Victoria Gardens Mall? Well, um, Picture an afternoon, it was, uh, it was actually a Thursday, Thursday afternoon, I think. Uh, soccer mom is driving her sport utility vehicle. Gonna go do a little shopping, enjoy the day at the mall. And she's slowly cruising through the parking lot looking for a parking space, really minding her own business. Um, Mr. Parker decides that she's not going fast enough for him and he wants to get around her, he's impatient, and he starts to drive around her. Just as she sees, oh, there's a parking space, I'm gonna turn, and she makes a, a turn. Well, she turns into him. Not her fault, he was acting like a creep, 
and um, <laughs> doing what he shouldn't have been doing. And he jumps out of his car. He runs up, starts kicking in her door here. That's the video. And I'm going to kill you, you effing this, oh. blah, 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 blah. Scares the heck out of me. Um, not, on, not on this side, but on this side of the, of the mall over here is uh, the AT&T store. And there were some AT&T uh, employees out there that actually witnessed it. Um, he ends up jumping in the car and, and taking off before the deputies get there. But they get a good description of him. They pull the surveillance video from the mall, which is what you're looking at. Um, they track him down and they actually get him into custody. But our jail system being what our jail system is, he was out about 12 hours later, out on bail. Um, in the initial documents when they arrested him, they talked about how there were witnesses at the AT&T store next door that saw it happen. So the following day, Mr. Parker, who fancies himself as like a Gambino crime boss, <laughs> really does, really thought that he was pretty important. Um, he shows up at the AT&T store and he says, I'm looking for Sally, who was the employee. That's not her. Oh, she's not here at work. Is there anything we can help you with? You just tell her she better mind her effort business and keep her mouth shut and not ever say anything to the cops. And he takes off. Well, we're not going to let that fly. Um, we uh, quickly started working on a case of uh, witness intimidation against him. We were putting him back into jail. We locate his house, and we do a search warrant on his house. And what do we find? He's into DVD piracy. <laughs> Huge into DVD piracy. In fact, um, has anybody ever made a copy of a DVD? I'm not saying illegally. Have you made a copy of a DVD at home, your home computer? Really. The stuff you have at home is a DVD burner. It burns an image onto your DVD. The ones that you buy at the store are actually pressed and stamped at a factory. They're not burned. We found large stampers, they call them, the industry calls them stampers, um, that he had acquired somehow. Um, the only thing we could think of is that you know, he had people that would steal stuff out of the various businesses. Uh, but when the, uh, the uh, MPAA and the motion, you know, all the recording people, they came out, their investigators came out, they were like, oh my goodness, this is huge. Um, they ended up sending some of this stuff to England to have forensics done on it. It turned out to be a pretty big case. We ended up sending him to, uh, into jail. The important story, back story here on Mr. Parker was we ran up his criminal history and going back 20 years, he had multiple arrests for violent, violent crimes. Domestic violence, attempted murder, assault with a deadly weapon, um, multiple violent crime arrests, all mostly out of LA County. He lived up in the valley. We couldn't understand that. Like, how could a guy get arrested so many times and not have one single conviction on his record? And um, as we started, we were on our search warrant looking through his house, we found a file cabinet. And in his file cabinet, he had case files from there on every single time he had been arrested. And every single time he had been arrested, he'd gone back and threatened the witnesses or the victims, which is exactly what he tried to do in this case. And, it, and it's funny because we listened um, to some of his jail calls, and he talked about how these country bumpkin San Bernardino cops are not going to get me. I've been had by the best in L.A., and they couldn't get me. We got it. <laughs> so I'm going to breeze through because uh, this is the important one, and, and uh, this is the one I really want to talk about. Um, this was a shooting case that we had real quick, and I'll just tell you, um, a lot of... A lot of our criminals, we talked about the ones that aren't that bright. A lot of them like to take pictures, keep them on their phones, and then hold them the guns they shot people with. Makes it pretty easy for us. <laughs> okay, vehicle burglary ring. Um, this was a pretty good case that I worked um, a few years ago. How many here have children or small children that they've dropped off at school in the morning? All right. How many of you have moms do this. I, I get it. I understand it. I do it with my boy. Get out of your car and walk your child into, into the school. Right? When you do that, how many times do you leave your purse or other belongings on the front seat? That's a lot, right? This particular group, um, what, they, what they would do, there was a ringleader, a parolee right here at the corner. He had several girls that were in his little group. 
And what they would do is they would sit out in front of elementary schools and daycare centers every morning. And they would do this from Redlands to Colton, all the way to Upland, Ranch Cucamonga, places like that. And they would wait for moms to come drop off their kids and they'd watch who were the moms that got out and diligently walked their kids up to the school. And then one of these girls would get out and they'd walk over and they'd see if there was anything worth it. And they'd smash a window. Some of these cars were, were locked. They'd smash a window, grab the purse, do all that kind of stuff, right? What their deal was, immediately as soon as they did that, they would get the ID out and they would try to determine which one of these girls looked most like the victim in their driver's license. From there, that particular girl would go wherever, um, gas stations, um, Target, and they would buy lots and lots of stuff. Now it really didn't matter what they bought, they, they, they were buying all kinds of different things in large quantities. We couldn't really figure out why in, until the end of the case. Um, this was, we talked about earlier about false impersonation where they, they uh, grabbed the victim's identity. This was one of the cases where they did that. From that gas station video, we were able to get a license plate number of a vehicle. We run the vehicle, we find out it's a rental car. We go to the rental car agency and the rental car agency says, uh, this is the person that rented the car. Showed us their driver's license, credit card, the whole nine yards, this is the person. So we thought, aha, we've got our suspect. We went to their house, did some surveillance on the house. It looked like a pretty normal house. Didn't look like anything that big of a deal. Um, started writing a search warrant so I could kick that door in and go in and get that stuff. Um, something didn't really sit right with us. The, the house, um, I mean, it looked nice. It just didn't fit. The person didn't fit. So uh, we started calling around some other police agencies and said, hey, um, have you ever had any calls to this house? It was actually a different city. And they said, yeah, uh, there was an identity theft victim that lives there. Um, she had her car broken into in another city, and they stole her purse and her wallet and her ID and all that stuff. And she's been reporting to us she's been the victim of identity theft. So we go, aha. So it's not really this person who rented the car. So we go back to the rental car company, and we tell them, look, don't say anything. They were coming in once a week to pay their bill. Don't say anything. We want to catch them when they come in. Okay, we won't say anything. Sure as enough, as soon as we left, they called the people, bring us our car back. We want our car back. <laughs> so we thought, oh man, we're never gonna get these guys. Um, they were just always one step ahead of us. Uh, we put their license plate number into um, the stolen vehicle system and hoping that the vehicle would pop up somewhere. One night I get a phone call from Border Patrol San Diego. And they said, hey, we just stopped your car coming back into the United States. So my partner and I jump, jump on the car, run down there and uh, one of these young ladies were in custody. What we found out was that they were buying truckloads, literally truckloads of stuff. That could have been tires, could have been baby formula at Target. They were driving down to Mexico and selling it in Mexico, and then they'd come back across the border. So they actually got caught coming back. Uh, immediately within a couple hours, we start tracking them. We find out they're staying at a local motel. We hit that motel with a search warrant. Um, and of course we find a cache yeah. of lots of stolen um, identities, credit cards, IDs, things like that. Um, that's the last of my case studies I was going to talk about. You know, as, as much as we try, try, and try, you know, um, sometimes Like I said before, it's, it's not a matter of if you'll be a victim, it's probably going to be a matter of when. To what degree and what type of crime is really up to you. Um, you can do a lot of things to protect yourself. Um, we'll go ahead and end this. If anybody wants to stay behind and talk, we can have some discussion. If not, there's my information. Thank you.